The storyline seamlessly transitions back to a pivotal memory involving Roman's father. In this reflective moment, Roman's father holds a steadfast belief that one's origin of birth remains an immutable aspect, irrespective of the heights one may attain in life. This conviction forms a cornerstone in his worldview, setting the stage for the interplay of aspirations and societal expectations within the family. Amidst this contemplation, Roman's mother introduces a speculative angle, positing that perhaps some incident transpired among the nobles during Romero's sojourn to the capital. There, Romero shared with his wife the discernment of gazes cast upon him by the nobility. These were not the familiar looks exchanged between equals, but rather scrutinizing eyes, laden with a certain judgment. Romero, however, remains unperturbed by the social nuances, expressing contentment with his present circumstances. A nuanced dialogue unfolds between Romero and his wife, revealing Romero's acceptance of his current station in life. He discloses his reluctance to embark on an arduous journey to accumulate more wealth or power. Despite his contentment, there lies a dormant hope within Romero, a hope that his sons will forge paths distinct from his own, transcending the limitations imposed by their humble origins. This adds layers to Romero's character, showcasing a complex interplay of satisfaction and unfulfilled aspirations. The narrative seamlessly transitions back to the present, where Roman's father is taken aback by the resolute gaze of his son. The eyes that meet his are not those of a malleable individual, open to persuasion. In this moment, Roman's father recognizes the fruition of a long-awaited vision. The once apprehensive child has metamorphosed into a self-assured individual, capable of making independent choices. Roman's father extends an encouraging hand, urging Roman to pursue his desires with the assurance of unwavering support. The message is clear. Roman doesn't have to navigate the complexities of life in isolation. Familial support is a steadfast constant. As the scene transitions once again, this time to the outside world, we are greeted by the sprawling shops of the blacksmiths of Dimitri. Roman's observation validates the widespread acclaim that Dimitri's smithies are unparalleled in scale within the kingdom of Cairo. The narrative details the grandeur of the workshops, with 30 such establishments lining the blacksmith street. The imagery evokes a sense of industriousness and craftsmanship, encapsulating the essence of Dimitri's prominence in the kingdom. In these meticulously described workshops, several blacksmiths toil simultaneously, creating a vibrant tableau of industry and craftsmanship. Roman, observing this spectacle, contemplates the veracity of the claims. The blacksmiths of Dimitri are indeed the largest and most prolific in the entire kingdom. As Roman strolled along the vibrant street of blacksmith shops, a revelation dawned upon him. The immense wealth amassed by the Dimitri family was laid bare in the very stones of this thoroughfare. This realization stemmed not merely from the opulence of the establishments, but from the underlying source, the iron mine nestled behind the Dimitri estate. It harbored the most substantial deposits in the entire kingdom of Cairo. The blacksmiths of Dimitri, with their unparalleled skill set, transformed the raw or from their rich mine into exquisite ironwork. The products were then sold at a premium, commanding a hefty price in the market. This strategic blend of resource and craftsmanship ensured that the northeastern nobles of Cairo dared not harbor any hostile intentions towards Dimitri. Beyond the awe-inspiring wealth, they recognized the pragmatic truth. The kingdom's reliance on Dimitri's iron weapons was so profound that any disruption in supply would constitute a critical issue. In Roman's mind, the symbolic figurehead of this industrial prowess was the master blacksmith, an individual who, through skill and leadership, embodied the Dimitri family's legacy. As the scene transitions, we find ourselves in Roman's father's office, a space steeped in history and decision-making. Roman, with a determined gleam in his eyes, reveals to his father his intent to take matters into his own hands. However, acknowledging the monumental task ahead, he humbly seeks assistance for a crucial aspect, the procurement of armaments to equip the soldiers under his command. In response, Roman's father, a figure once at the helm of the family's smithy affairs, advises him to seek the counsel of Master Hendrick. Master Hendrick, once a collaborator with Roman's father, now held the mantle of responsibility in the Dimitri family's blacksmithing endeavors. Following Roman's father's elevation to peerage, Hendrick seamlessly succeeded him. In his role as the family's master, Hendrik bore the weight of overseeing all facets of ironwork production. Roman, 
now tasked with this pivotal mission, expresses gratitude to his father. Yet, a note of caution lingers in the air. Roman's father imparts a crucial piece of advice, a subtle reminder of the intricacies woven into the fabric of the Dimitri legacy. The blacksmiths of Dimitri, it seems, are not swayed by the mere echo of the family name. Prideful and discerning, they demand genuine merit and understanding. With this counsel resonating, the narrative unfurls onto the bustling street outside, where the ironforged creations of Dimitri craftsmen adorn the shop fronts. The eyes of the workers, fixated on Roman, tell a story of skepticism and scrutiny. As Roman navigates this visual tapestry, he realizes that earning the trust of these prideful artisans would be no easy feat, especially considering his past actions. Amidst the lingering glances, Roman proceeds to Hendrik, who, in the midst of his craftsmanship, queries Roman about the purpose of his unexpected visit. As Roman entered Hendrik's workspace, he couldn't shake the feeling that his father had sent word ahead about the purpose of his visit. Hendrik, the master blacksmith in charge of Dimitri family's ironwork, met Roman's gaze with a serious expression. Roman got straight to the point, informing Hendrik that he needed equipment to arm 30 soldiers. Hendrik, while acknowledging the request, injected an unexpected dose of skepticism. He suggested that he initially thought Roman might be there to pilfer something due to running out of money for entertainment. This revelation caught Roman off guard, but Hendrik quickly directed him to a corner of the workshop where an assortment of equipment was stacked. In a surprising turn, Hendrik urged Roman to take whatever he needed, emphasizing that the items in that corner would be more than enough to equip 30 soldiers. The generosity left Roman taken aback, prompting him to seek confirmation. With a hint of disbelief, he asked Hendrik if he was genuinely permitting him to take the supplies. Hendrik's affirmative response didn't alleviate Roman's surprise. However, as Roman questioned the quality of the equipment, the atmosphere grew tense. Picking up a sword from the corner, Roman expressed disappointment, suggesting that the reputation of Dimitri's ironwork might be exaggerated if this was considered suitable for soldiers. His probing continued as he asked Hendrik if this was truly the best work he could offer. Hendrik, now visibly agitated, shot back at Roman, stating that if he wasn't satisfied, he was free to leave. Undeterred, Roman pressed on, questioning the authenticity of Dimitri's renowned ironwork. Hendrik, in a stern retort, reminded Roman that passing judgment on the quality of their ironwork required more than mere observation from someone who had never endured the searing heat of a blacksmith's furnace. As the tension lingered, Hendrik divulged a critical detail. Had it not been for Baron Romero's request, Roman wouldn't have received anything. He proceeded to draw a stark contrast between Roman and his younger brother, Rodwell. While Rodwell diligently apprenticed under Hendrik, preparing to succeed the family, Roman, as the eldest son, squandered his time pursuing fleeting pleasures on the streets. With a cutting tone, Hendrik drove home the gravity of Roman's inadequacy. He asserted that, even compared to the equipment scattered on the workshop floor, Roman Dimitri was deemed irredeemable trash. As Roman stood before Hendrik once again, he couldn't help but feel a sense of deja vu addressing Hendrik. He acknowledged the palpable anger in the air, reassuring him that he understood the source of Hendrik's frustration. However, Roman couldn't overlook the glaring issue at hand, the sword in question. With a discerning eye, Roman pointed out that this particular weapon had been forged with an alarming lack of precision. The uneven application of force during the crafting process had resulted in a sword so poorly made that it changed color simply from exposure to sunlight. Roman emphasized that this couldn't be considered a product of Dimitri's renowned ironwork. Despite this obvious flaw, Hendrik had chosen to sidestep the issue and resort to personal insults instead of acknowledging the subpar quality of the equipment. Hendrik, Visibly surprised by Roman's candid assessment, listened as Roman recounted a recent tragedy involving one of his soldiers. The soldier had met an untimely demise due to the inadequacy of the sword. Roman vividly described how the blade, far from being a testament to quality craftsmanship, failed to cleanly cut through flesh, resulting in the soldier's bewildered death on the battlefield. Roman questioned the injustice of the situation highlighting the soldier's futile efforts to survive armed with nothing but subpar weaponry provided by his lord, Roman Dimitri. As Roman passionately shared this sobering tale, Hendrik grappled with the weight of the revelation. Roman then shifted his attention to a piece of armor, challenging Hendrik about the suitability of such weak protection for soldiers. 
He argued that the heaviness of armor would be justified if it could effectively shield the body. However, the chainmail provided by Roman had failed in its duty to protect a soldier, leading to a fatal outcome. Roman illustrated how the soldier's trust in the finely stitched iron pieces had been shattered when an experimental piece from an unknown blacksmith failed to withstand an enemy's attack. The armor betrayed the soldier, resulting in a grievous wound that exposed his organs. Hendrik, still grappling with the gravity of Roman's words, sought clarification. Roman responded, emphasizing that the issue extended beyond the inferior quality of the equipment. He believed that Hendrik's frustration stemmed from the eldest son, Roman himself, only stepping forward when there was an immediate need, rather than consistently addressing the ongoing concerns of the family's blacksmithing endeavors. As Roman inspected the scattered ironwork, it became evident that Hendrik held little interest in the smithy. While Roman empathized with Hendrik's disinterest, he believed that Hendrik had overstepped a boundary. With a stern expression, Roman addressed Hendrik, pointing out that if he failed to recognize the pieces on the floor as trash, the soldiers following Roman might unwittingly risk their lives with subpar equipment. Roman stressed that this issue extended beyond personal feelings or a desire for retaliation. It directly impacted the lives of 30 individuals. Despite Hendrik turning away from the truth, Roman questioned whether Hendrik could genuinely consider himself an artisan proudly representing Dimitri when he offered what Roman deemed as inferior equipment. The pieces, tainted by Hendrik's personal feelings towards Roman, jeopardized the lives of individuals who had done nothing wrong. Hendrik attempted to defend himself, stating that jeopardizing lives wasn't his intention. However, Roman asserted that intentions held little weight in this context. The clear purpose of weapons and armor was to provide reliable protection, and Roman had made the request with the authority of Barco Romero, his father. Instead of furnishing suitable equipment, Hendrik had offered what Roman saw as pieces of trash. Roman interpreted Hendrik's actions as a form of insubordination toward his father. In the midst of the heated confrontation, the workshop echoed with the clamor of other workers pouring out to witness the exchange between Roman and Master Hendrik. Reacting to Roman's perceived disrespect, some workers, noting the sword in Roman's grip, were poised to physically restrain him. However, before matters escalated, Hendrik intervened with a commanding order to halt, temporarily quelling the potential physical altercation. It was in this charged atmosphere that Hendrik, rather unexpectedly, extended an apology to Roman for the tumultuous situation that had unfolded. The narrative then gracefully shifted to a poignant memory etched in Hendrik's past. As a fledgling smith, Hendrik found himself at the receiving end of stern reprimands from his elder craftsmen for producing subpar equipment. The memory unfolded with a young Hendrik being assigned menial chores as a consequence of his lackluster craftsmanship. During this period, a pivotal incident unfolded, a moment that would leave an indelible mark on Hendrik's understanding of the craft. While engaged in his chores, Hendrik overheard a scene playing out within the workshop. An adventurer had approached the owner, seeking to purchase a sword for a mere gold piece, promising to repay the debt later. Despite the adventurer's earnest plea, the owner declined the request. Witnessing this exchange, young Hendrik was stirred by a sense of compassion and a desire to rectify his own perceived shortcomings. He took it upon himself to forge a sword, an act of kindness that transcended the confines of commerce. Hendrik approached the adventurer and offered the sword free of charge. Grateful, the adventurer accepted the gift and ventured forth on a mercenary mission. However, the tale took a tragic turn. The very sword crafted by young Hendrik failed during the escort mission, resulting in the adventurer's untimely demise. This haunting incident left Hendrik profoundly impacted, instilling within him a solemn vow never to repeat such actions. Returning to the present, Hendrik grappled with the realization that he had, in essence, repeated the tragedy of that fateful day due to personal animosity towards Roman. He regarded himself with a critical lens, seeing his actions as those of a pathetic individual. In a rare display of vulnerability, Hendrik confessed to Roman that he would bear the consequences of his misguided actions. Roman, Sensing the depth of Hendrik's remorse, extended an unexpected olive branch. He reassured Hendrik that if he was genuinely repentant to such an extent, Roman would not pursue the matter any further. This unexpected turn revealed Roman's capacity for forgiveness and understanding, acknowledging the complexity of emotions at play. Transitioning to the practical matters at hand, Roman acknowledged Hendrik's undeniable prowess as a blacksmith. 
Despite the recent conflict, Roman made the surprising decision to entrust Hendrik with the critical task of crafting equipment for his 30 soldiers. In a gesture of reconciliation, Roman expressed his belief that Hendrik's actions were likely driven by animosity, and he proposed burying both of their mistakes in the mud of the past. In the quest for swords and armors to protect the lives of his soldiers, Roman presented Hendrik with an unexpected chance at redemption. The revelation left Hendrik surprised, grappling with the evident transformation in Roman. Although rumors of change had reached Hendrik, witnessing the stark difference firsthand left him in contemplation. It became clear to Hendrik that the Roman standing before him was not the same individual as before. Recognizing the sincerity in Hendrik's remorse, Roman reiterated his commitment to the safety of his soldiers. Hendrik, realizing the gravity of his misguided actions, offered another heartfelt apology. Promising that such a lapse in judgment would not repeat itself, Hendrik pledged to craft weapons and armors for Roman soldiers that epitomized the highest quality ironwork, a source of Dimitri's pride. This promise resonated with Roman, securing not just the necessary equipment but also a newfound understanding. A smile graced Roman's face as Hendrik instructed his workers to resume their tasks and initiated the meticulous process of crafting the high quality equipment. The workshop, once fraught with tension, now buzzed with focused activity as the workers, under Hendrik's guidance, began forging the tools of war that would safeguard lives. However, amidst this unfolding reconciliation, a worker divulged a crucial detail that shed light on Hendrik's lingering animosity toward Roman. The source of Hendrik's resentment traced back three years when Roman, in dire need of money after a lord severed his allowance, clandestinely entered the smithy. In a regrettable act, Roman stole Hendrik's prized sword and sold it to a street merchant for a paltry sum. This particular sword represented Hendrik's masterpiece, a labor of love that consumed six months in design and an additional three months in meticulous crafting within the confines of the smithy. The revelation struck Roman with a pang of remorse, realizing the depth of the transgression committed by his former self. As Roman contemplated the gravity of his past actions, the realization dawned that the old Roman had crossed a line. With this revelation in mind, he prepared to leave the shop. However, just as he was about to exit, Hendrik emerged from the shadows. While Hendrik acknowledged Roman's recent request as a form of reconciliation and extended a chance at redemption, he made it clear that forgiveness for the stolen sword hadn't been granted. Hendrik, despite accepting responsibility for his own wrongs, couldn't overlook the negligence of the eldest son of the Dimitri family when it came to matters of the smithy. With a stern yet measured tone, Hendrik reminded Roman of the foundational importance of the smithy to Dimitri, urging him to bear this in mind moving forward. In the prospect of Roman one day crafting a subpar sword with his own hands, Hendrik might reassess his opinion of him. Roman responded to this hypothetical scenario with a confident smirk, assuring Hendrik that the day of a flawed creation wouldn't be far off. With a casual farewell, Roman stated his intention to return once the weapons were completed. Later, Roman made his way to the workshop where he had undergone solitary training. The interior met his gaze in impeccable order, precisely as Roman had directed. Every tool lay at the ready. With a resolute expression, Roman commenced the creation of his own sword. Reflecting on a past chapter of his life, Roman delved into memories of his time in the Murim at the age of 18. This period was marked by the uncertainty surrounding the successor for the demon cult and frequent discord among brothers. Constantly vigilant against assassination attempts, Roman faced a critical juncture when his 11th brother, Bek Changian, ambushed him, intent on taking his life. The ensuing battle saw Roman's cherished sword succumb to the onslaught and break. In a narrow escape from the brink of death, Roman resolved to forge a sword that could endure any battle and fully harness his current physical capabilities. Motivated by this realization, Roman sought guidance from various blacksmiths outside the Murim, learning the art of sword forging. Before each decisive battle, he meticulously crafted a sword tailored to complement his evolving self. Through hundreds of thousands of battles, the sword underwent continuous refinement, culminating in the creation of the 39th sword known as the Heavenly Demon Sword, a priceless treasure beyond measure. Now, as an impending war loomed, Roman felt the necessity of fashioning a sword attuned to his present self. 